Morning everyone, Milton here on a very chilly Sunday, uh, Saturday morning actually. Um, so today um, it's a little chilly so I have a, my, a coat on but it's also part of the illustration that I want to illustrate today. So uh, I don't know if anybody has seen my previous post this morning about 1 John 3.19 or 3.20 which basically is uh, talking about our condemning hearts. Um, and so I'm going to read it real quick, and uh, it's actually verse 20, 1 John 3, verse 20. And it says, Whenever our hearts make us feel guilty and remind us of our failures, we know that God is much greater and more merciful than our conscience, and He knows everything there is to know about us. So this week... Uh, I've been feeling in my spirit more so than anything else is almost like the winds of adversity, the winds of condemnation, the winds of just doubts coming toward us, even though we may not have anything to doubt about. And so this morning, as I was reading the scripture and I was putting it up on Facebook, um, you know, I started reading a little bit more uh, on this particular um, setting of scripture and also started doing some other uh, other. Uh, Bible versions. And so I'm hoping everybody can hear me okay. Uh, and so I'm going to start off with the King James and then from there I'll go to the expanded version. And then from there I think it might be the Amplified or the Amplified uh, Classic. Uh, and then from there it will be from, uh, uh, I believe it's called The Voice. Is another version I like to read. It's a contemporary version. Uh, and then lastly I'll end it off with the Passion Translation which is where this is coming from. So starting off right now with King James, it says, and hereby, going from uh, 1, 1 John 3, 19 through 22 is what the scripture's uh, reading is going to be. So, and hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knows, knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God and whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things which are pleasing in his sight. So that's the King James. The expanded version puts it this way. This is the way or by this way we know and will know perhaps in a future moment of crisis. This is the way we're going to know, perhaps, in a future moment of crisis, that we belong to the way of the truth. When or if our hearts or our conscience make us feel guilty, condemn us, or convicts, convict us, convicts us, we can still have peace before God. Our hearts can be assured before Him, for God is greater than our hearts. And he knows everything. My dear friends, beloved, if our hearts do not make us feel guilty, condemned, or convicted, we can have, we can come without fear into God's presence, have a boldness and confidence before God. And God gives us, we receive from him what we ask because we obey God's commandments and do what is pleasing what pleases him this that's the expanded version this right here is only a uh, verse 20 i think it's the amplified or the amplified classic it says whenever our hearts in tormenting self accusation make us feel guilty and condemn us we are in god's hands for he is above and greater than our conscience or our hearts and he knows and perceives and understands everything nothing is hidden from him and now moving on to the the um the voice version i like this version a lot as well as the, the passion translation this one says there is a sure way for us to know that we belong to the truth even though our inner thoughts may condemn us with storms of guilt and constant reminders of our failures, we can know in our hearts that in His presence, God Himself is greater than any accusation. He knows all things, my beloved ones. 
if our hearts to, cannot condemn us, then we can stand with confidence before God. Whatever, whatever we may ask, we receive it from Him because we follow His commands and take the path that pleases Him. And as with all the other uh, devotionals, I usually put them, uh, all of these scriptures in the comment section. So look for them in, in later on in the comment section, please. And now I'm going to finish it off with the Passion Translation, which is what started this thing off. So it says, uh, 1 John 3, 19 through 22. In the Passion Translation, it says, We know that the truth lives within us because we demonstrate love in action which will reassure our hearts in His presence. So that means that when we are acting out love, when we are doing things in servitude, serving others, meeting somebody else's needs because of love, it reassures our hearts before God or in His presence. So when we come to church, we can experience God's presence in a deeper realm, a deeper experience because we've been serving others through the love of God. So once again, we know that the truth lives in us because we demonstrate love in action, which will reassure our hearts in His presence. Whenever our hearts make us feel guilty and remind us of our failures, we know that God is much greater and more merciful than our conscience. I love that part. When our when our hearts make us feel guilty and remind us of our failures. And sometimes our hearts are not the ones that remind us, but it's also our friends, our family members. And they're the ones that, that are so quick to remind us of our faults and our failures and make us feel guilty over something that we may have done years ago. Something that may have been already forgiven of years ago. But then they're still the first ones to remind us don't you remember that one time that you did this thing wrong? You acted a certain way. You said a certain thing. And they're, they're the first ones to attack us, to remind us. When our hearts are not condemning us, our friends will, our family members will. Because they'll say, we know who you are. We know what you're about, right? So whenever our hearts make us feel guilty and remind us of our failures, we know that God is much greater and more merciful than our friends and our conscience. And we know, and He knows everything that there is to know about us. My delightful beloved ones, when our hearts don't condemn us, we have a bold freedom to speak face to face with God. A bold freedom to speak face to face with God, face to face. And whatever we ask Him, we receive because we keep His commands. So that's the part I want to talk about right now is when our heart is condemning us, what is the source of that condemnation? Where is that coming from? And the answer is found in, Roman, in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, which says, Now therefore there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who live not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. The operative word there, or phrase there, is who live not after, or walk not according to the flesh, but after the Spirit. That means that whenever I start giving into my flesh, whenever I start walking after the flesh, I'm going to feel condemned because what happens is when we give into our flesh, when we start to sin, when we give into those temptations, right? Then the devil has access to us. And so he's the first one to condemn us or to, to, to uh, dangle this, tempt this tempting carrot in front of us. Oh, do this, do that. Oh, no one's going to see. Nobody really cares. Don't worry about it. Just go ahead. It's just you and me right now. No one's watching. No one's listening to you. Don't worry about it. Just go ahead and do it. That's what the devil is doing. He's the first one to tempt you. Yet, when you fall for that temptation, he's the first one to condemn you for messing up. Although he was the one that instigated, he's the one that lured you out with that temptation. Obviously, he is taking notes and he's watching you. He's studying you as a hunter. He's watching you. The devil is, uh, has been doing this for a very long time, right? And he's been doing it with kings. 
priests, you name it, of the Old Testament. He's been trying his tricks on people. He deceived Adam and Eve. He deceived uh, David into numbering the people. He deceived kings and priests, people who are wise and full of faith. Yet, he's still trying to deceive the world and he's trying to do his tricks on you. That way, so he's here tempting you, luring you out by what you are weak for. I'm gonna say that again. The devil is tempting you with that which you are weak for. If you're not weak for something, he's not going to tempt you with that. But he's studying you. So I find that COVID really revealed a lot about all of us, myself included, right? And we start noticing what things we started kind of slipping into the gray areas of life is what I'll call it. Because... Not many people went to church and not many people gathered together. There was a, a disconnect in the spirit. There was a disconnect among the people of God. And so what happens is when there is no fellowship of godly fellowship, the Bible says in 1 John, I believe is 1 John 7 and 9, I believe. It says, for if we abide in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us of all unrighteousness. Forgives us of our sins and cleanses us of all unrighteousness. The blood of Jesus flows when we have godly fellowship together one with another. But what happened in COVID is everybody scattered. Everybody was became isolated and separated. And so there was no blood flowing during that time. And people started slowly but surely going into the gray areas because they did not feel accountable to anybody and so they said okay you know well maybe nobody else is watching i'm still good god it's just me and you god you know you know you're not going to condemn me over this you know and so people started maybe sipping wine maybe puffing you know smoking something whatever you know, and they started going into these gray areas when they before knew that it was sin. But now they're stepping into this. And so now the devil is taking notes. Every time you fall for one of his tricks, he's taking notes. Okay, she likes this. Okay, he likes that. Okay, next time I want to tempt him, I'm going to tempt him with something greater in that same area. Because I know they're going to fall for that every single time. Right? One of them, and it doesn't always have to be a sensual thing. It could be one of the things that I find among more mature saints is anger. People are easily angered when there is injustice. In uh, Ecclesiastes, it says that injustice, and I paraphrase, injustice makes a wise man upset or mad. When they experience injustice, when they see injustice, it makes a wise man mad or crazy. Right? And so, like I said, so all of these different areas, the devil is taking notes and he's trying to access into your life that he might be able to condemn you. That's the ultimate goal is to condemn you, to make you feel guilty. Why? Because if you start feeling condemned, you're not going to want to come to God's presence. You're going to feel like, oh my God, if I come to church, a lightning bolt is going to strike the church and destroy it because of how sinful I've been living, what things I've been thinking, the things I've been meditating in my heart, the things that I've been watching with my eyes, the things that I've been listening with my ears, the things that I've been thinking about others. All of these different things, the devil is using these things to affect your conscience. So what's the answer? The answer, like I said, it's Romans 8, 1, which says, Now therefore there is no condemnation to those which are in Christ Jesus, who live not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So if you live in the Spirit, you walk in the Spirit, you're not going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. However, if you do not sacrifice your flesh, if you do not go ahead, if you do not put your life on the altar every morning, the flesh is, has some weird way of regenerating itself. Let's say I cut off my finger, I can't regenerate my finger. However, if I cut off my flesh, the next morning it's there. So I have to die daily is what Paul says. I die daily. I have to crucify. I have to deny myself. Jesus said it. If you want to be my disciple, first of all, deny yourself, then pick up your cross, then follow me. 
So you have to say no to yourself, the things, and that brings about honesty. You have to be honest with yourself because you know the things that you're tempted with. You know the things that you are lured by. The Bible talks about it in James. It says, let no man say when he is tempted or when he is tested. Let no man say that he is tempted of God. Because God tempts no man, but a man is drawn away of his own lust. Is tempted. A man or a woman is tempted when they're drawn away of their own lust. So what happens is the devil sees the bait. He knows what you're weak for because he's been studying you. And so he starts going and he starts going and he starts tempting you with the thing that you're weak for to lure you out lure you out of what lure you out of being in Christ because if you're in Christ then you're hid in the light if the devil's in the darkness what blinds the, the darkness the darkness is blinded by the light it cannot see the light the Bible talks about it in John chapter 1 and says and this is basically the light the true light that came into the world that lights every man and Light came into the world and the darkness had no power to overcome it or to bring it down. That is a, it's a different translation. I'll put it in there in the, in, in the comments as I always do. Uh, and so, you know, there's scripture for everything that it is that I'm saying, whether it's a literal translation or a principle or coming from a different version, or maybe even sometimes doing from a Bible study, you know, doing a word study from Strong's Concordance, which is what I usually use. To do the to do the word studies, but once again, so I'm going to end it with this in the the, the Passion Translation, First John chapter three, verse nineteen to twenty two. We know that the truth lives in us, lives within us, because we demonstrate love in action. My dear brothers and sisters, let us not love one another in word and deed, not just with mouth service, not with just with lip service, but also in action, also doing it with a genuine heart, also doing it out of pure love, not a motive of, you know what, I'm going to be nice to you because I can get something out of you. That is a, an agenda and that is not genuine, but that is self promoting a personal gain, having respect the person's for gain. You're trying to use that person to get ahead. God sees all of this, right? We know that the truth lives within us because we demonstrate love in action, which will reassure our hearts in His presence. It reassures us. The love of God reassures our hearts when we come into God's presence that we can come boldly before the throne of grace and access the mercy that is there for us in the time of need. We won't come boldly if we feel insecure, if we feel that God is going to be upset with us. But we have a high priest in that Hebrews verse. Uh, it says basically that Jesus is our high priest and he goes before us. And because he goes before us, therefore we can go boldly before the throne of grace. Because we're following the leader. We're following Jesus into the presence. Coming boldly before the throne of grace to access the mercy that is there for us in the time of need. The eternal sacrifice, we go before it. His blood makes us worthy. So once again, we know that the truth lives within us because we demonstrate love in action, which will reassure our hearts in His presence. Whenever our hearts make us feel guilty, not somebody else's mouth, our hearts, our conscience, whenever our hearts make us feel guilty and remind us of our failures. We know that God is much greater and more merciful. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And greater and more merciful is he than your own self-condemning conscience. We know that God is much greater and more merciful than our conscience. And He knows everything there is to know about us. My deli deli delightfully beloved ones, when our hearts don't condemn us, we have a bold freedom to speak face to face with God. Who spoke face to face with God? That was Moses. He, which, he was called the friend of God. He said to everyone else, I'm going to, God said, I'm going to speak to them this way and that way above the mercy seat. But with you, Moses, I'm going to speak face to face as a man speaks with his friend. 
So we can have a bold freedom and a boldness because we know that our hearts, even though they may be condemning us, God is greater and more merciful than our hearts. And therefore, when our hearts don't condemn us, we can come with bold freedom to speak face to face with God. And whatever we ask of Him, that's, what's, that's what happens next. When I have a confidence in God, when I know that He loves me and that He is forgiving me because He is more merciful and He is greater than my condemning heart, I have a boldness to come before Him and ask whatsoever I will. And the Bible, Jesus said, and I will do it for you. Hitherto you have never asked anything in my name, but now ask in my name and I will do it that the Father may be glorified. So, and what? Ever we ask of him we receive why because we keep his commands and I'm gonna say the 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 um, the voice translation because I really enjoy that part about the storms and this is part of the reason why I have it right here today uh, you know as you see like you guys can see be, uh, behind me there's a huge like thunder cow clouds and everything like that so the the voice translation puts it this way there is a sure way for us to know that we belong to the truth. Who is the truth? What is the truth? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the truth. And that truth that he gave, him, he gave himself, that sanctifies us. That makes us holy. There is a sure way for us to know that we belong to the truth. We belong to him because he purchased us with his own blood. Even though our inner thoughts, our self-image, what we think about ourselves, the way that we see ourselves, sometimes is based on external, what people have said about us, maybe growing up when we were young and maybe we were put down, maybe we were kicked down, maybe we were talked to in a condescending way over and over again, maybe we were excluded from everyone else, maybe we were made to feel like we were different and that there was something awkward about us. And because of that, it starts affecting our conscience and our self-perception and our self-image. But there is hope because we can have our new image that's found in Christ Jesus, not our own. I may be a mess according to who I am as a person, but put me in Christ and I'm a totally different person because now I am a new creature in Christ Jesus. All things have passed away and behold, all things are become new. Now, even though our inner thoughts, my thoughts, your thoughts, my thoughts in my heart, your thoughts in your heart, even though our inner thoughts may condemn us with the storms, right, right, <laughs> visual illustration, with the storms of guilt and constant reminder of our failures. I believe, I forget where it is, but it's in the Old Testament and it says, my sins were ever before my face. My sins were ever before my face. Everywhere I turned, my sins were there, condemning me, condemning me. You sinned, you messed up. You sinned, you messed up. You're a failure, you're no good. When the devil starts condemning me and telling me I'm no good, I'm not gonna fight with him. I'm gonna say, you know what, devil, you're right. I am no good. I mess up, I fail, I sin every single day. There's not one single day that goes by that I don't sin. However, however, I have the ability to repent. I have ability to ask God to forgive me. And guess what? He's going to forgive me. But he does not. He does not have that luxury. He does not have that option. And once he fell, that was it. There is no redemption for him. And that's the reason why he's so mad. Because he's so mad that he has no way of being redeemed. And then he sees us. That we are such failures and such weak people. And yet... God still redeems us. God still restores us. God still forgives us. God still cleanses us. God still doesn't give up on us. However, he fell one time and sinned one time. And there is no redemption for him. And that's what makes him so mad. That's why he's always attacking us. Because he can't attack God, but he goes after his image. Who is or what is his image? You and I, the body of Christ, are his image here on earth. And I was, as I always say, I try not to take too long, but you know, once I get started, it gets started, right? <laughs> so thank you all for bearing with me. So as I continue on, right? 
even though our inner thoughts, the things that I think about myself, the things that I feel about myself, the things that I know about myself, is what the devil uses to condemn me. My, even though our inner thoughts may condemn us with storms of guilt and constant reminders of our failures, and so we start projecting that to others. We start thinking, hey, you probably don't like me because you know what's happening in me, even though they don't know. But you start thinking it in your mind that everybody sees you and everybody knows every weakness about you and they, everybody is judging you for messing up that they don't know anything about. And the thing that you confessed and you asked God to forgive you of, he doesn't remember it anymore, but it's your guilty conscience. Because... Even though our inner thoughts may condemn us with the storms of guilt and constant reminders of our failures. Of our failures. Our failures become the source of our self-condemnation. And the, that fact that the source of our condemnation is our failures actually means that we're proud. Because somehow we start thinking that maybe we shouldn't fail. Maybe that we shouldn't make a mistake. Maybe that we should be above all this already. But you know what? Our flesh is weak. Jesus said, the spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. Yet, Jesus demonstrated how the weakness of his flesh, when he was in the wilderness, tempted 40 days and 40 nights of the devil, being tempted, as I did a devotional a couple weeks ago, being tempted of the devil, 40 days and 40 nights, constant bombardment. Boom, 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 boom. Tempted with everything you can imagine under the sun. Yet, the Bible says that he was weak in his flesh. But yet, at that point, he demonstrated what the grace of God could do with the weak and frail humanity. You can overcome the devil the way that he overcame the devil by talking back to the devil with, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. It is written, thou shalt worship the Lord your God and him only shall thou serve. It is written, it is written, it is written. We have something to say. As long as we keep our mouths shut, the devil will have a heyday on our mind and constantly bombard us. And like I said, even though our inner thoughts may condemn us with storms of guilt and constant reminders of our failures, we can know in our hearts. Even though I feel guilty, even though I feel like a failure, even though I condemn my own self, I can know in my heart that in his presence... God is greater than any accusation. Jesus, they brought him a, uh, a woman caught in adultery. Caught in the very act of adultery. She was having sex with somebody that was not her husband at that point. And they found her. I don't know how these people knew, the Pharisees knew, but somehow the religious spirit can always sniff out somebody else's sin, right? They have some sort of magical power, some sort of uh, inclination that always is able to detect somebody else's sin. And at the same time, it makes them blind to their own sin. I'll let that sink in for a little bit. The religious spirit, right? They went out and they found this lady who was committing adultery and they brought her to Jesus to tempt Jesus and say, okay, well, what's he going to do now? What's he going to say now? So they brought her because according to the law, he was supposed to stone her. If he was righteous, he was supposed to be the one stoning her because that's what it was according to the Old Testament law, right? And so Jesus in his wisdom says, let him who is without sin throw the first stone at her. And then the Bible says that their own conscience, their own conscience convicted them. And they dropped all of their stones from the greatest high priest, not the high priest, but the greatest priests, the elders, to the youngest person. They all dropped their rocks and their stones. I'm here among the stones. I'm going to move this around a little bit. So you guys could see, there's some stones here. I hope you guys can see that okay. Uh, and so basically, this lady, 
When it was all said and done, she was sitting among the stones, the piles of rock, which became an altar at that point is what I would consider. It became an altar for her of sacrifice and gratitude. And she said, Jesus said, where are your accusers? Where are those who are going to condemn you, who are accusing you of doing something wrong? And she looks around and she said, there's nobody here. They're all gone. All my accusers are gone. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. However, he didn't say go and sin some more like some people may believe. He didn't say go and sin some more. He said go and sin no more. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. They cut you in the act. I gave you mercy. But now this mercy is not for you to go do it again. This mercy and this grace that I cut you in the act. I was merciful to you. I did not judge you. I did not throw a stone at you. But now take this grace. Take this mercy and run with it. And do not go back to it. Lest a worse thing come upon you. Right? So going back to, uh, to, to the scripture reading here. Even though our inner thoughts may condemn us with storms of guilt and constant reminders of our failures, we can know in our hearts that in His presence, God Himself is greater than any accusation. He knows all things, my beloved ones. If our hearts can, cannot condemn us, then we can stand with confidence before God. What? Ever we may ask, we receive it from him because we follow his commands and take the path that pleases him. So I come to encourage you today in the midst of the storm of guilt, the midst of the storm of condemnation, the midst of the storm of your failures and all of these accusations that the devil is using to make you feel less than God is greater and you are in his hands as one of the one of the. Um, translations puts it says when this happens when you're feeling condemned you're in God's hands and he is greater he is greater than the condemning of your own heart so I come to reassure you today God did not come to condemn you Jesus didn't come to condemn the world but rather to save the world and that's still the mission for you today for him for you for me to save us, to redeem us, to cleanse us, to wash us, to make us better, to change our lives, to transform us. What for? That we might also share the gospel and that others might be saved as well. I pray that this finds you in a much better place today. My delightful, beloved friends, when our hearts don't condemn us, we have a bold freedom to speak face to face with God. And that's what we want to get to. So when our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and he's not going to condemn us. But if we are loving, if we are doing the acts of love and we are doing serving others through love, then that reassures our hearts. And therefore we can come boldly to the throne of grace and access the mercy that is there for, for us in our time of need and speak face to face with God and whatever we ask him. Whatever, whatsoever, whatsoever is a word without limitations, is an unlimited word, whatsoever. It could be that, it could be that, it could be something phenomenal, something out of this world. Whatsoever you ask, I will do it, is what he promised. And whatever we ask of him, we receive. So we can know for sure that our prayers are heard and our prayers are answered because we keep his commands. Let's keep his commandments. And what is his, what is his commandment? That we love one another as he has loved us. Love is the 11th commandment. There are 10 commandments in the Old Testament. Jesus brings in the new commandment. He says, this new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. How did Jesus love us? Sacrificially. He gave himself for us. 
That's the way we're supposed to love others. The same way that Jesus loved us. How do we treat others? We treat others not as bad as they are, but as good as God has been to us. With the same type of love, we know that they're not worthy, just the same way we were not worthy of his love. Yet we treat them good. Love your enemies. Do good to them that despitefully use you. Pray for those who persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely. We can overcome evil with good. Who's good? His goodness. His good. Working, operating in our lives. And love makes us blameless before our accusations or the accuser of the brethren. So I pray that this was a blessing to you all. I'll put this thing on, on the YouTube as I usually do. And I'll put the, the um, my YouTube page that I store all of these videos. Uh, because Facebook started... Uh, only allowing them to uh, allowing my videos to be kept for 30 days. So that was the reason for that. Uh, and so I started a, a YouTube page. Uh, but I pray that this was a blessing to you all. Be encouraged. God loves you. God is not here to condemn you. He is here to save you. Jesus came not to condemn the world that was already condemned. But he came to not to destroy men's lives, but to save them. He's actively looking for you. He's actively pursuing you. He's actively, actively working to save you. Let us work on our own salvation. Work out our own salvation with fear and with trembling. Now that we know the truth, now that we know that God is merciful and that he's not going to condemn us, let us not go willfully singing, sinning. Like I said, you may fall and fail because of the weakness of your flesh. But yet you still have the willingness of your spirit. I pray that you would have that grace to deny yourself. Being honest with ourselves. And say, God, this is tempting me. This might be so nothing for somebody else. But this is tempting me. I feel a lure for this thing. And I know that I should be above this already. I've been serving God for 5, 10 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, whatever it may be. But now I find myself in weakness to this thing. God is not going to reject you for being honest. He wants you to come clean. He wants you to confess your sins that he might forgive you of your sins. There's a 100% chance of you being forgiven of the sin that you confess. There's a 100% chance that you're going to be forgiven of the sin that you confess. Now, if you don't confess it, then there's a percentage that you're not because how is he going to forgive something you haven't confessed? You have to acknowledge your sin. You have to be honest. And he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And that unrighteousness is what brings, attracts the condemnation into our lives. So I pray that this finds you today. God bless you guys. Until next time.